Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our podcast where we talk about new books in media and communications. I am your host, Marcy Maserato. With me today is Donald Barclay, author of the book Disinformation, The Nature of Facts and Lies in the Post-Truth Era. Donald, welcome back to the podcast, and thank you so much for joining us again today. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to be back. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've had you on before with your um, previous book. So this is your second book, right? Disinformation. Second book on on information. I've written other books on other topics. Right. So because this is is this? Do you see this as part of a continuation um, for the for your previous book? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, I, I like. I've been telling people the the first book, uh, the book Fake News, Propaganda, Plain Old Lies, was kind of a how to about managing information and misinformation and trying to evaluate credibility. I've been telling people this book is more of a how come, how, how come things are so fraught and contentious in this information world we're living in right now. Yeah. And can you um, just remind our listeners uh, what you're currently doing, what your your background is um, and kind of what um, what led you to, to really thinking about disinformation, both from that practical how to standpoint and the more theoretical um, standpoint? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I'm the deputy university librarian at the University of California, Merced, and I've been a librarian for 30 years. Um, before that, I was uh, I taught writing, uh, college writing for four years, and I also worked as a wildland firefighter in my youth, so I've done a few different things. Um, but uh, the, the fake news book really got started with the 2016 election and all the, uh, the fear about fake news that that sprung up at that time, Uh, it became a real hot topic. And as someone who's been teaching people about information for a a long time, I I, I realized, hey, this is is exactly what I've been teaching people about for years. I really should say something about it. So I wrote the fake news book, um, really thinking about an audience of maybe college students, but also adults who are struggling like, well, how am I supposed to know what to believe in? And how do I really evaluate information, which is, which is easier said than done. You know, evaluating information is, is, is nuanced and certainly our, our, our feelings and cognitive biases and prejudices and ideas about the world make it all the more difficult um, to, to do that. So that was what the fake news book was about. And then the disinformation book um, was was really a follow on to that because I felt like, well, I was I, I was pleased with fa- the fake news book, but I thought, you know, there's really a lot more to say about really philosophically why why is this so hard and and why are we in this state of of such turmoil, which is not entirely new. There's always been turmoil over information, and you know, as you, if you go back to ancient times philosophers asking well, what is truth you know what what can we really believe what what's reality what's an illusion it's not a new question and even things like conspiracy theories are very old and and people um, using information to gain wealth and power and influence over others is really old um, but I feel like my, my thesis in disinformation really is that the digital technology has really, amped up the problem and and made it more um, noticeable. And because we we live in the information age now, uh, it's made it that much more urgent for us to come to terms with this. And, and we're dealing as a, as a world, dealing with this fairly new technology that we haven't had a lot of time to assimilate and really come to understand. So anyway, in, in the disinformation book, I'm really trying to look at you know why? Why are we in this state? What's what's different about it um, because of digital technology, and and to an extent, how might we deal with it? So that's kind of where I came from on this book. And um, full disclosure, obviously, I'm I've already endorsed the book <laughs> officially, so I'm an, I'm uh, on the back, which I was very honored um, to get that email from the the publisher. So thank you for thinking of me, and I really. To, oh, go ahead. Thank you for your endorsement, of course. I appreciate that greatly. <laughs> yeah, and I and I would certainly not endorse something I didn't truly believe in. So I really do. I love this book because I, I like the way that you write. Um, because 
you you write from a very very it's 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 accessible and it's just great um you know and i say that even as as a as a scholar um because i i try to do that in my writing as well um to to make it these kind of you know this accessible book and i and i think that you know this this uh book this your 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 other one was great as well. Um, and this one, I can definitely appreciate it from a scholarly perspective because it does have more of that kind of theoretical component to it, but it's still very, it's just, it's easy to read, um, which is great. And you can really like wrap your head around it in a way that you're like, oh, that makes sense. Because you really take these complex things, you know, um, and, and just talk about them and explain them. And I really appreciate that about your book. Well, well thank you. And, and I think, uh, you know, my writing style is partly um, just my nature. I'm, I, I, I like to, I like to tell stories really, and that I, you know, I don't write fiction, but I, I like to tell a story when I'm writing, and and to make ideas that are complex um, more accessible. And you know, other people, of course, you know, the the brilliant, you know. The Noam Chomsky's and stuff, they can make things as, as you know, and the, the, the Foucault's and the Derrida's can make things complex. And, and they're brilliant, too, in their way. And, and those are, are great works to get your head around. But that's not my style. And, and I'm not comparing myself to those brilliant, brilliant minds either. I'm, I'm not in their league. But I, I enjoy trying to, to write for an audience that I imagine as intelligent and, and probably educated. But I'm not really trying to write to you know, the, the top 1% of brilliant intellectuals or anything like that. That's not my audience. And that's okay. <laughs> so you're right. Like Chomsky, you know, Chomsky, Foucault, Derrida, they're great, but Derrida is notoriously insanely difficult to understand that us scholars, we kind of bond on that. We're like, Oh, we gotta, we gotta read Derrida now. Oh, I you know. Know? Well, so yeah. It's like a passage, uh, you know, it's uh, so, um, so just let's start with the basics in terms of, the idea of disinformation, because I think there's even been a shift with how we talk about, quote, fake news, whereas now we're really referring it to as a disinformation and misinformation, um, because there is such a thing as real fake news, right? Things that are purposely made to be fake. So can you talk a little bit about that distinction and even the evolution that you've seen in the just in a few years from your, your first book and, and your second book related to this topic? Well, I, you know, Disinformation is not entirely new. Obviously, you know, you go back and look at Nazi Germany or, you know, you look at the the wars, that were, the culture wars that were going on during the Protestant Reformation that turned into bloody gun and knife wars. But um, people um, have, have for a long time have tried to control people using information as a weapon. And uh, again, digital technologies just made it that much easier to weaponize information. And I think that uh, people, you know, people realize that, well, if I can, if I can win somebody over with, inf with information and with disinformation by telling them a story that's largely untrue or constructed in such a way that, that it causes people to not really think about the whole, the whole breadth of all the things that are going on. And, and, and I think a great example of disinformation is simply uh, the kind of reductionist um, way of presenting really complex problems. And uh, often it involves blaming somebody else. I, we live in the Central Valley. We have water problems, you know, water shortage. And of course, agriculture is a huge billion dollar, multi-billion dollar industry here. And it's really easy for one group of people, the sort of John Muir environmentalists, save the earth people to go, it's a bunch of billionaire investor people who are sucking all this water dry and they don't care about the Central Valley and they're, you know, they're going to suck all the water dry and then when it's gone, they're going to go on and invest in something else and we'll be left holding the bag and it's their fault. And then you sort of got the conservative farmer view, which is it's Gavin Newsom and these liberal politicians they are dumping all our water into the ocean to save a bunch of fish and they're causing the drought. And if we just built more dams and, you know, it, it's, it's a very simplified way of looking at the problem. But it really ignores a really complex problem with lots of people to blame. And, you know, of course, it's always easier to blame other people than yourself, right, um, to point the finger elsewhere. So disinformation often involves blaming somebody else, uh, absolving ourselves of, of any guilt in the process, in the problems. And um, that if you can, I, I think 
because digital technology has made it so easy to spread information uh, through a lot of channels and, and do it really cheaply and quickly, that it, it is um, at least tempted people who have agendas and want to shape thinking and shape events to realize, oh, if I can change somebody's mind through telling them a story, then I don't have to get a gun and shoot them in the head, right? And it's actually cheaper to do it that way than the other way. Now, you look at what's going on in Ukraine, and obviously um, Vladimir Putin decided that he wasn't changing anybody's mind through disinformation and took it to the next, unfortunately, to the next bloody and horrible extreme of actually shooting people and killing people, and it's it's a big mess. But um, I think that, um, you know, until ruthless kind of leaders get to that point, I think, in, especially in the digital world, that we're still trying to figure out how far can we go, how powerful is information in this new world, that they're willing to try a high level of disinformation before they resort to other ways and more conventional and and awful ways of trying to make people fall into line and do their what they want. Yeah, and you start, so your first chapter, you really start talking about um, the meaning of truth and the post-truth culture. So let's start with how do you define what it, what does post-truth culture look like? What is that? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. It's, you know, I, I struggled with what to call it because if you say, you know, post-truth environment, then, it, you know, it sounds like you're talking about climate change and that's not what I'm talking about, you know, and I did, I wanted to try to find a, a way to, to express that idea. And I think um, post-truth culture is, it's tied into the, I, I th- which I get into more in the, the final chapter, but this idea that um, we're living in a world where popular culture and, and really the kind of entertainment that comes with popular culture, and by that I include, you know, sports and in a way politics have become a form of entertainment to a lot of people. Um, advertising, all of these things that have gotten into the pop culture budget bubble that these that this um because pop culture is really just a, about a way of of making money and exerting influence that it's kind of become the culture and it's it's like in advertising with some limits does truth really matter in telling a fictional story whether it's on a, a, a soap opera or a sitcom or a something that passes as a news program but really is entertainment, does telling the truth really matter? You know, does it really matter that six pe- young people living in New York could never afford the lifestyle of these great apartments and hang around a coffee shop chatting with each other for hours on end? That's a fiction, but it doesn't matter because it was one of the most popular sitcoms in the history of television that made a lot of money, right? So I, I think that that's how, that's helped shape the, the, the post-truth culture because in this, this larger popular culture bubble that we are living in, um, and, and it's become also a more participatory culture because of digital technology. People can be participants in it. In the 90s, you sat there and watched Friends or Seinfeld but now you have these ongoing digital dramas unfolding, you know, um, where you become a participant in Will Smith slapping uh, Chris Rock, you know, and, and your comments and your reactions and your likings and your dislikings, it becomes, you become a participant in the show and it becomes um, in a way real to you, even if maybe your understanding of it is, is incomplete and not very real. Yeah, you know, as someone who studies, I spent a lot of time studying popular culture, and it really is incredibly powerful, you know, just popular culture in general, which obviously is it's a huge term. But as you mentioned, like using, you know, Friends or, you know, Seinfeld in these really, really popular 90s sitcoms as an example, um, and and with how we have social media now, we definitely have, uh, you know, as Henry Jenkins talks about, like a convergence culture, both in the technology as well as participation and participatory culture with fandom and things like that. Um, how, 
And I, and how damaging do you think that is? Do you think that it's actually better to have the, the participatory culture or where do you think that line is in relation to kind of situating ourselves in this post post truth era? That That's an interesting, interesting thought. I mean, um, you know, if you, if you watch Seinfeld, I'll go back to Seinfeld, you know, and you go, Oh yeah. George Costanza is just like my friend, Phil, you know? And so you sort of believe that George is real, but you know, he's not real, real. And, and you know, your friend has some characteristics of George Costanza and George Costanza is an interesting character because there are things about him that are very real. And we recognize in other people, if he, if he was a fictional a totally made up character, we wouldn't respond to him very well. I mean, not that George is the greatest example of right, a human yeah. being, but, <laughs> but, I get but it. you know, I mean, we wouldn't, yeah. we wouldn't laugh at him. We wouldn't find him entertaining. So, but we, you know, there's that, that sense of, well, Seinfeld is kind of real, but I know it's something different. And, and in a participatory culture, I think it's, it, it may be, it may be healthy to participate in, something like a political idea that's flying around and you're, you know, it's on Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or whatever you use and you're making snarky comments about and, and or weighing in or, um, you know, I, I see a lot of, uh, you know, on Facebook, I see older people, people my age, I'm old, you know, um, waxing nostalgic about the past and, and I can kind of chuckle along with it. But I can also step back from that and go, yeah, they're remembering the past, but they're not really remembering it all that accurately. You know, they're they're fictionalizing the past as something, as older people often do, as something way better than the present. That's a very common cognitive bias to to believe that the the past was somehow better, um, and and that's fine, you know, in, in a way to participate that and say, oh yeah, I remember when gas was twenty nine cents a gallon, you know, and uh, that was good times. And, you know, why can't these students just get a part-time job and work their way through college the way I did when literally the, my first semester of college cost $180. That's true. I remember the check, you know, uh, not anymore, you know, and even if you can't factor in inflation, it was like the equivalent of about $700 today, you know? So that, that's, that sort of, misremembering the past as an example and it's kind of harmless but then I, obviously if you take it too far if you take it to the point of really starting to dislike and mistreat young people and and really lash out against them in ways that are tangible and intangible maybe um that's very harmful you know that's where it gets into the real world it's sort of like if if you were i'll use QAnon as an example if you're really into QAnon and it's kind of like a show to you or a team that you follow. And, you know, you're on the QAnon team just like somebody roots for the Dodgers or the Giants. Or you follow QAnon the way somebody might follow a soap opera. And you really get into it. I mean, if you if it's just you being online and you're not really doing anything actively and it's just something that it's kind of an entertainment for you, even if you don't kind of process that it is entertainment, it's kind of harmless. It may even be a good outlet, but obviously if, if you start, you know, stocking up guns and planning to kill people, then it becomes a real problem, obviously. And so that's, I think that's where the, the danger is, is when, when does participation in something like this become, less just fandom and more something really dangerous. It's like, again, using the analogy of sports, it's great to be a Dodger or a Giants fan and root for your team. And, and on, I've, I've sat in ball games where I'm a Giants fan and we make fun of the Dodger type fans who are there and they make fun of us. And, you know, we, we make jokes and we say, oh, hey, it's the first inning. Have you ever seen the first inning of a game before? Because Dodger fans are notorious for coming late, you know, and they, they make some fun of us about the Giants and blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's fine. But when, you know, often fueled by alcohol, when people start throwing punches at each other and beating each other up, and then it, the videos go online and people, you know, Dodger fans are me tooing that the Dodger guy knocked a Giants fan on his butt, you know, and and 
that that's a very different kind of thing. That becomes really, you know, that's where it becomes really harmful when it starts having those kind of effects in the real world. And you mentioned, like moving into your second chapter, you talk about the science of the mind in this post-truth culture. So you actually talk about really the way our brains work and how that leaves us vulnerable to disinformation. So can you talk a little bit more about how how human psychology has a major impact in this? Well, I, I've already mentioned cognitive biases and everybody has them. Every You, I, everybody does. And they often work on us without us realizing it. And and uh, you know the cognitive bias of of seeing the past as better than the present that's very common you know um, especially for you know as you get older people develop that bias um, so there's there's lots of there's a bunch of cognitive biases out there and they I think I say in the book there's some some uh, brain, some people who study human cognition have said a very interesting statement they said. It, from an evolutionary standpoint, a cognitive bias is not a flaw. It's a design feature because the example I give in the book is if you're if you're living in the savanna of 200,000 years ago and you hear a noise in the bushes and your cognitive bias immediately goes, big cat, going to eat me, and you shoot up a tree – that's a good cognitive bias to have because even if, you know, nine times out of ten it's not a big cat, the effort you expend climbing the tree is worth it because you didn't get eaten the one time it is a big cat. You know, that's that's how cognitive biases work on us. We have these brains that were evolved in a time of stress of, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago. But in the modern world, we still are walking around with those brains, but very few of our decisions are that lightning quick. And so a cognitive bias that, that causes you to run up a tree is, is useful in, in this stress environment, but it's not very useful for making a long-term in financial investment or figuring out which political candidate is most likely to do good. Um, because you know, we, we have the time to analyze these things if we take the time, which is hard and takes work. And our cognitive biases are not really very good at making those kind of decisions. And then I talk about um, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, who did this work with the idea of heuristics. And they actually, these are statistically based findings that they made back in the 1970s. And eventually Kahneman got, who's a psychologist, got the Nobel Prize in economics for his work with heuristics. Uh, but the, the idea is that we take these mental shortcuts because trying to think and, do, and really calculate the statist- statistically of what's my best option is too much work, so we take a shortcut. And you know, they use examples like the gambler's, gambler's fallacy, which is, well, the ball has landed on black five times in a row. It's due to land on red. Well, in a fair roulette wheel, that has no bearing on where the ball is going to land next. It's a, it's a heuristic, but people fall for that and use it, even though it's statistically invalid. But other kinds of, stati- of heuristics that we use are... Um, are generally useful, you know, they, they can be useful, but we rely on them too much. And we, and we, then we, we end up making decisions that are not very well balanced. And, um, you know, an, an example would be, you know, I'm, I'm walking down a dark street and my heuristic tells me this is kind of a dangerous situation. I better be alert because I've seen a lot of movies and I know from the movies, this is a dangerous situation. So that's not a bad heuristic decision. You know, I'm alone on a dark street. I should be extra alert, extra cautious, you know, maybe um, keep my eye open as I walk past this alley to make sure there's nobody going to come out at me. That's not a bad heuristic decision. But if we extend that too far, we we end up making really bad decisions about based on, you know, I'm walking down a, a, a regular street. And here comes somebody, and because of the way they look, I'm going to make a decision that they're dangerous or they're not trustworthy. Or I make a decision about somebody's personality 
an intelligence based on the way they talk. Because they have a southern accent, they must be a bigot and stupid. That's a bad heuristic. But people do stuff like that all the time. Yeah, and it's incredibly damaging. Right, it can be, yes. I mean, you know, um, it, it's it, – they're, they're, heuristics are okay as long as you don't take them too far, but we tend to take them too far, and then they become stereotypes and, and prejudices and so on, and that's where they really become problematic. Yeah, and I think that's as, – as you're um, kind of talking about that, I, I start going into really how we start using stereotypes as shortcuts – in, in terms of judging other people and then stereotypes are just inherently negative because they're created and they're used to so often oppress specific voices. Right. And, and it just, and they're implicit. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's getting back to the idea of disinformation. You know, the idea of, of people who are trying to mislead people selling really simplistic ideas and simplifying problems down to, well, there's just this one cause for it and it's all their fault. That really plays on to these heuristics, you know, the, the shortcuts we take, you know, it's, it's all the fault of this one group of people. They're the bad people. You know, it's the Ukrainians. They're a bunch of Nazis. It's all their fault. Simple story. There's nothing else to it. Right. And that's an easy story to sell. And it's easy to glom onto that heuristically. If you're living, you know, if you believe Vladimir Putin and, and go along with that idea because it, it it's it's simple. It's not complex. It's not, well, let's unpack a thousand years of Ukrainian Russian history and, you know, right. and go through all, all the culture and language and geography and politics of the last thousand years to unpack what's really going on. And that's hard, you know, and, and people don't, it's hard to do that homework. Yeah, it's it's hard, you know, it's just, it's just a lot easier to live in the bumper, bumper culture, you know, bumper sticker culture type of thing where you just kind of water things down, um, which which I understand, you know, from wanting to get, uh, you know, people out into the streets and really, you know, um, advocate for a specific cause or something like that. You know, you, you want to have these, uh, you know, slogans, if you will, that can be very powerful, but there also has to be the space to, to really unpack and understand what, what these condensed ideas may mean, you know, in protests and what you, because there's, there's often a very, very complex, um, underlying history to all of these things, you know, obviously with, with this Supreme court leak about Roe v. Wade. Um, and just, you know, how there, I, I had just, uh, had read an article where, um, there were particular, like there was a group of protesters that were going in, uh, or actually sending hangers, to SCOTUS and the abortion rights, you know, uh, activists were saying that's actually going too far because they're talking about the, just how horrifying that imagery is. And they just don't want people like women to think that that's what they have to resort to. And I was like, that's, you know, that's actually, it's a perfect example of like, oh, right. We can't just do things just to be provocative so there's a way to to do it to to really not perpetuate really nasty stereotypes and really bad ideas because there could be a young impressionable girl that doesn't that may think that that's what she needs to resort to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there, there's a you know um, I I just heard a really good example. I would have put it in a book if I'd heard it before I wrote the book. You always whenever you write a book, you always think, oh, I wish I could have included that. But <laughs> or, and then right. there's also I wish I hadn't said that. But let's not go into that. But um, you know. I, I talk about Marshall McLuhan in the book, and of course, McLuhan really made his name talking about electronic media, specifically television. And McLuhan's very simplification of his idea was electronic medium is changing the way people think the way the printing revolution changed the way people think. And you know, a, a lot of what McLuhan said about television in the 60s, you go back and look at it and you go, ooh, he kind of was calling what's happening now, you know, <laughs> which is also, of course, electronic communication we're dealing with. But Eisenhower was the first presidential candidate to use television. And he he was very opposed to this idea, but these Madison Avenue guys got to him and said, we're going to make TV commercials that are going to be 30 seconds long. And 
and Ike was like, no, 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 that's that's not the right way to do it. You know, we need to explain our position. They go, no, 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 you don't understand television. That's not how it works. So you had, you know, I like Ike, you know, and you had a little little man on the street and woman on the street interviews of ordinary Americans just like in soundbite saying why they liked Eisenhower. Adlai Stevenson bought half hour time blocks where he sat there analyzing policy for 30 minutes. He got crushed because he that's not how TV works. And he was making the idea too complex for television. And, you know, I, I think, again, you know, it's the bumper sticker mentality. The bumper, You know, if it fits on a bumper sticker, it's probably not a very good idea. You know, it's not been thought through very well. And that's, you know, that's what we're, we're you know, as McLuhan was saying, you know, this electronic medium is really going to change the way we think. I think we're experiencing that uh, in, in a pretty serious way, which I, I talk about that in chapter four of the book, but um, that in, in the digital world um, where we, we're sort of, if, if McLuhan and people like McLuhan and Walter J. Ong are right and others, we're really moving beyond the book and the printed word is central. And we're not leaving them behind, but they're not as central as they used to be, that we're moving into this, what Ong called secondary orality where things are really fast paced and really interactive, well, that's where the soundbite and the clip and the, you know, the simplified idea um, can hold sway. It's like, you know, how many, how much do we hear people talk about freedom in this country? And I'm, I'm not against freedom. I'm all for it. I, I totally believe in it. <laughs> but you, it's in movies, you know, the end of Braveheart, freedom, you know, and uh, there's songs about freedom and you know, um, it's, it's mentioned in TV ads, you know, buy this vehicle and you'll have freedom, you know, and, but how often do we stop and anybody really, you know, in, certainly in popular culture, does people say, well, what does it mean to be free? What does freedom really mean? You know, does owning a gun mean you're free? And some people will say, yes, absolutely. But I think you could question that. I mean, Gun politics aside, whether it's right or wrong to own a gun, and, and I'll, I'll be straightforward. I own a couple of guns. I've owned, I grew up shooting as a little kid, a very little kid. I started shooting when I was 10, and I, I don't shoot much anymore, but I own guns. Um, but, you know, um, does, you know, gun politics aside, does owning a gun actually make you free? And, and I would say, well, it's you know you could say well look at the Ukraine well yeah okay they're fighting for their freedom with guns it's certainly helping them but I would say owning a gun means you're free <clears throat> the same way that owning a wedding ring means you're happily married you know it's just something you buy right yeah. <laughs> it doesn't guarantee <laughs> anything really. <laughs> yeah. and uh, and by the way I'm married and happily and I own a wedding ring so you know I'm, I'm but I don't believe my wedding ring causes my happy marriage. Sure. Um, <laughs> right. It's it's not the material representation of it. Yeah. Any more than I believe that I'm f that a gun really makes me free. That that I could still own my guns and not be very free. I believe that 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 could very well be the case. So, but the point is, we don't stop to analyze those things because that doesn't fit on a bumper sticker very well, and it doesn't. You know, when when William Wallace is dying at the end of Braveheart, he doesn't. You know, there's not a 15 minute explication of what freedom would actually mean to a 12th century Scottish nobleman, as opposed to some guy on the internet today. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's where like Derrida, a reading of Derrida and like, just how the definition, you know, differs and is, is just different. Like, you, there are so many different ways to define the idea of freedom, but it does become, you know, in political speeches, I, it's just this thing that we hang on to, but I'm like, but what does that really mean? Right. Cause it can really become manipulative and you talk about propaganda, right. And in terms of like, well, freedom is, is definitely a word that can, can easily fit in there because we hear it and we're like, Oh, well, I like freedom. That's a good thing. But what is, but what does that mean? Um, so when you talk about propaganda and you talk about the good, the bad and the persuasive, how do you think it fits in with disinformation and what this really looks like? Well, obviously propaganda is, is really old. Um, and you know, I, I, I think that clearly if you're trying to, you know, if you're Vladimir Putin and you're trying to convince people that, you know, the Ukrainians are bad and you're justified, you certainly resort to propaganda. I mean, he obviously 
government propaganda, he he's gotten the the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church to endorse the war. That's clearly a propaganda move. Um, and you know, obviously, you know, the word propaganda comes from <laughs> a religious movement, a religious like you know, it was the Catholic Church that started the propaganda, although propaganda pre-existed that. Um, so I think that you know, it, it's it's a form of disinformation. I think that you know, as I talk about in the book, it's it's kind of you know it's a it's a difficult thing to talk about because our our concept of propaganda, especially I think in the United States, is so negative that propaganda is just evil. You know that nobody nobody likes propaganda. Propaganda is like you know um, predatory child sex or something. It's just like it's nobody wants that. Nobody likes that. That's it's just evil. But it's propaganda is around us. It happens all the time, and I think that we can. We, you know, almost anybody you could you could show them some kind of propaganda for something that they believe in, and show them why this message is propagandistic, and they would say, well, yeah, that's justified. You know, if if for example, if if and I'm I, I don't even have a real example. This I'm just spitballing here. But if you if you found something from promoting Black Lives Matter, and you could analyze the message and say this is a propagandistic message. Well, a lot of people would say, I don't care because it's conveying an important message that I believe in. And I think what, you know, the, the lesson for all of us is to understand, yeah, we're surrounded by propaganda. And pretty much every political message has a propaganda element to it. But what we really need to be aware of is, okay, I... I understand this message. I I may agree with it or disagree with it or be neutral about it. And I really am thinking carefully about what's propagandistic about this. What what part of it is trying to manipulate me in a in a way that is unequal. And I think that's part of the definition of propaganda is that the the purveyor of the propaganda is trying to convince the recipient to do something that may or may not be in the recipient's best interest. And it's almost, it's always in the interest of the propagandist. The message always favors the propagandist. It may or may not favor the recipient. And that's what we really have to be aware of. And I use some examples in there of, of some, you know, election time propaganda from actually some, some elections that happened in California that are pretty much meaningless now because they're passed and nobody cares about them anymore. They, they've already been decided. But the idea is that on both sides, there were propagandistic messages, and and your your feelings about those messages really depended on how you felt about the issue. And what do you think, or what are some of your suggestions for possible solutions to that on both those that should perhaps be creating better messages that are not propagandistic, as well as those who are receiving it? Yeah, I well, I think when people want something, when they want to win people to their cause, it's really hard to tell them don't be propagandistic because, um, you know, you're not going to get, you're not going to get elected to office and you're not going to get a cable news show if your approach is, well, here's the situation and these are the facts. And yeah, the people on this side, they have a good point of view and I understand that, but the people on the other side, they have this point of view and I understand that. And nobody, you know, is going to pay attention to that. You know, they want to, they, if you're going to persuade people, you have to come on pretty strong. So I don't know that you're ever going to persuade conveyors of messages to swear off of propaganda. But I think you can, what, what I would hope people would get from my book is just to be aware of that, to be aware of how you're being asked to think a certain way, the way the message is favoring the interests of the sender. and that you as recipient um, need to, to, to just be aware that, that basically you're, you're being manipulated. And, it, and I think it, it gets to, uh, going back to our conversation about freedom, um, there are times when I'm, you know, I, I receive a message and I think about it and I go, well, you know, they're really trying to manipulate me here. But I'm willing to be manipulated because I think, that what they're trying to get me to do or believe is a good thing. And it's the right way to do it. The right thing to do. 
and I can kind of separate that from the message itself as opposed to <clears throat> not not being aware that I'm being manipulated and, and then end up doing something that maybe I, I, I wouldn't do or is not in my best interest. You know, there's, as I say in the book, there's, there's no campaign in the history of political campaigning that has ever told somebody, well, oh, you really shouldn't vote for our candidate or you shouldn't give us money because if we win, what we're going to do is going to be bad for you. <laughs> They'll take your money every day and your vote every day, even though they know that what they have planned is going to be bad for you as an individual. And that's that's just the nature of, of politics and the nature of of propaganda. Propaganda is about winning, really, and convince, convincing people of doing things, maybe against their will. And we are, we're surrounded by it. We get it all the time. You know, advertising is basically propaganda. And, and we need to be able to just try as best we can to, to think about what's really in our best interest. What do we really believe? What really matters to us? And, and I think, again, going back to freedom, I think that's the key of trying to be free. I mean, none of us can be completely separate from our upbringing and culture and language and DNA and all these factors that affect us. We can't step outside of those perfectly, but we can be careful about um, the choices we make and, and even the products we buy in, in asking ourselves, is this really what I feel is the right thing to do? Is this the right way for me to go? Or am I really being manipulated beyond a reasonable level for me? Because uh, like I say, we all get manipulated. And I think it becomes very dangerous when that manipulation turns into fanaticism for a particular cause or a particular it could be product. It could be, you know, just fanaticism in general, I think is, is really dangerous and, and certainly propaganda. Just, I think that's what it seeks to do is, is kind of create fanatics. Um, well, when it convinces you that um, it's okay to, you know, invade the Ukraine and start killing Ukrainians, that's a, that's a pretty bad, that's a very bad thing, you know, or when it convinces you that you, you know, that, that your small group of people, you know, whatever little group you're part of, maybe there's a hundred thousand of you in the United States and, it, and the propaganda convinces you that your small group has the right to dominate everybody else in the country and tell them what they think, regardless of what they may think. You know, that's, to me, that's the real, you know, that's the no go line of, you know, um, if, if you believe that you're better than, than the majority, and I know that there's problems with the majority and people being manipulated and all these other things, but at the end of the day, there's a famous uh, quote that's attributed to Winston Churchill. I mean, he may or may not have said it, but he, it, he said something like, uh, democracy is the second worst form of government in the world, but every other form of government is tied for worst. So, <laughs> you know, it's democracy is not perfect, but it's all we have, especially in the United States. That's what we're based on. And when people start going around saying our small group has the right to determine for everybody else, that's that's fanaticism at its worst. And that's people, I believe, who've been propagized, propagandized um, and in, in the worst possible way. And kind of really, you know, looking at propaganda, you go in and talk about how information actually wants to be free and have its own freedom. And can you talk about why it's not? Why is it information free? Why, why information isn't free? Well, that's that's a really good one and something I, you know, I deal with because I, I'm in the information business. You know, libraries buy information and make it available to people. So we, we deal with that, the dollars and cents of information all the time. And, and the fact is that all information costs money to create. And somebody has to do the work. And even if you're doing the work for free, if you're writing on spec, let's say, you have to have the time to sit there and do that work and create that information, um, the leisure to do that. You know, so um, if, if you were, um, let's say, uh, you know, uh, the slave of somebody and, and they kept you hopping 80 hours a week and left you no time except to sleep and eat, you're not going to have the time and, and leisure to create that information, not to mention you don't have any tools for creating that information, whether it's paper and pencil or a computer or what have you. Um, and you've also got to have access to 
if you're, if you're going to create information and share it with people, you have to have a way of sharing it, which can be, of course, really expensive. Now, I think that what's happened in the digital age is that digital age has digital technology has made it a lot cheaper to create information and a lot cheaper to distribute it. Now, whether whether anybody actually picks up on it, you know, if you have a website, are people going to come to it? Maybe. Or if you put something on Twitter, is it going to go viral? Well, it could. Probably not, but it could. Um, so it's it's made information seem a lot cheaper, but there's still a cost to it. You know, you have to have um, some some kind of resource in order to create information and share information. And so there's there's always going to be a cost to it. And it means that also that information, besides having a cost, has a value. And that's why we've seen, especially as we've gone more to an information age and information economy, you've seen things like um, copyright become more important and more copyright has gotten longer and more restrictive in some ways because that information is way more valuable in the digital age than it's ever been. There's, there's money to be made and um, in films and podcasts, even, you know, not every podcast makes a lot of money, but some of them do. And, and of course, even writing books still, you know, people like Stephen King make ungodly amounts of money writing books still. So the information has, more value than ever. And it means that um, trying to extract that value and control the marketplace for that value has become more complex than ever. And, and controlling the other side of the digital age is that digital technology has made information cheap to create and to share, but it's also made it harder to control. And that's one of the things we're finding, of course, with copyright, one of the big struggles is that in, in, the, in the print age, copyright was pretty effective because it was really intended to stop one manufacturer from stealing the product of another manufacturer, a print, one printing operation from stealing from another printing operation. And so it worked pretty well for that in the analog world, but it doesn't work so great in the digital world where you can copy something sitting at your desk in two seconds and share it widely uh, in three seconds. So all, all of those those factors have have contributed to this world of where information, because it has value and, and it has dollar value and it has obviously political value when you can use information to control people and, and get your way in the world. Um, that it, it's it's never going to be free, it, um, you know. Even though it might may seem like it's free, you know, and and the idea of of being on Facebook, you know, well, hey, that's free. It's a free service, right? But it's not free because they're using your content that you're creating, and they're using the information they gather about you to make money. And you know, um, the title of my book is disinformation, but I actually at one point I really wanted to call it. Um, we sell ad senator, which is a quote from Mark Zuckerberg when he was testifying before Congress. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, before um, before the U.S. Senate, and um, the senator from Utah just died. I'm sorry, I just forgot his name. Uh, he just passed away. Uh, anyway, this old senator asked Zuckerberg, you know, what's what's your business model? And Zuckerberg replied, "We sell ad senator," and that's so true. You know they, that it really is. You know, it, it's it's a free service that allows people to sell ads. In that sense, it's not that much different than old-fashioned broadcast television, which was a free entertainment service that sold ads, and that's how they made their money, obviously. And but what we're seeing slightly different thing in the digital age is not not only are we observing, we're not just watching Seinfeld, we're writing the script, <laughs> we're providing the text <laughs> for Facebook and Twitter and all of these other services. So. And of course, there's always, uh, you know, part of the allure of the digital age and, and social media is, and I think a lot of young people especially are, are lured by this is, oh, well, what if I go online and I become a big hit and I'm making millions of dollars suddenly, you know, and we read all these stories about, you know, young people who have, you know, Twitch, Twitter, Twitch channels and, 
all these other things where they make millions of dollars. And it's, it's, it's a new version of the old story of, well, if I sit in the drugstore in Hollywood looking cute long enough, some, uh, movie producer is going to come by and put me in the movies and I'll be rich and famous. You know, it's, it's kind of the same story, but it takes even less. You don't even have to go to Hollywood. You can sit in your bedroom with a smartphone and maybe you'll become, to, maybe you'll be discovered by the masses. Right. And it's, and there, yeah, there's definitely a democratization of like, you know, YouTube, for example, but you know, even to be a filmmaker, there, there's still the, distribution aspect of it. So there's, there's the pros and cons to all of that. So we still, unfortunately there, you know, you, you have more outlets to create content, which do create uh, sometimes visibility and people do get discovered, but then it also kind of gives a false sense of hope where that's still very rare. And I'm not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure that the rarity has really gone, <laughs> that it's become that much more common. It's just become different, right? right. With the technology and, we have. And again, it's one of the pop culture stories. That's not that true. You can go online and get rich. Well, some people do. A few people do. But it's not very likely, you know. Um, and some of the things you have to do, if if to get rich you have to, you know, have a fans-only site, uh, you know, th are you willing to do the things people do on fans-only to make money? Uh, that's kind of... That's that's a very that's a choice that may come back to haunt you, you know. If right? You... Yeah, because when you say, "Oh, it's you know, you have an OnlyFans account," and then you're just like, "Oh, what is that?" Yeah, it takes on a persona of its own in terms of what what it is, um, you know. And there's certainly a lot of there's legitimacy and and, and fakeness in all of these different platforms, uh, but they do, you know, they all tend to have their own kind of ideas of of uh of what that what the content is curated for so it'll be interesting to see what's going to happen with twitter now that one single person just purchased it yeah yeah i i it's going to be very interesting because you know is he going to invite donald trump back on uh and you know one of the things i talked about in, in this information is the idea that twitter is is very much a secondary orality form of communication it's it's post Gutenberg. It's post print, because even though it's based on writing, which is what secondary rally does come out of writing, but it's it's very interactive. It's very um, fast paced. Uh, it's participatory, and you know um, one of the things I, I talked about in the book is Donald Trump was a master of Twitter, because he would you know he would say something on Twitter. And his stands would come in and go, yay, Donald Trump, you're so smart. We love you. And his haters would come in and go, ooh, boo, you're terrible. And then Donald Trump could respond to a stan or a hater if he felt like it or not. And, and it was this kind of back and forth, very performative kind of thing. And, and that's, that's very typical of, of secondary orality. Um, and then... But then, you know, one of the things I mentioned in the book, too, is a lot of uh, some of the people who were the most well-known people who hit back at Donald Trump on Twitter were, were stand-up comedians. But stand-up comedy is totally in that secondary reality mode, too. It's based on writing. Most stand-up comedians write their routines. But it's all – it's performative. It's quick-paced. It's interactive. And if you've ever if you've ever listened to a recording of a stand-up comedian or watched a video, invariably, without exception – they're done before a live audience because if you do stand up comedy without an audience, it's pretty blah. You have to have that interactivity of a real audience there. And, and that's, you know, that's kind of, that, that's the difference between Donald Trump going on Twitter and going, well, climate change is a bunch of BS because uh, somebody was talking about climate change the other day and it was snowing on her the whole time. Ha ha ha. Um, and that's totally different than, Al Gore writing a 10,000 page think piece about climate change and publishing it in a magazine, which is very Gutenberg parenthesis printing tech way of thinking. I mean, yeah, your, your book, as I mentioned, I, I'm a, a big fan of it and, and I, and we, you know, we're, we barely scratch the surface today with this. So I do recommend to, that our listeners buy it and read it <laughs> um, and have these conversations with their fellow colleagues and, and other people um, in their lives. So uh, is, is this going to be a trilogy? Or are you doing, a, are you working on the third one? Uh, I don't know. Um, I haven't really hit on an angle for a third book yet. I'm, I'm still kind of grasping for an idea and, you know, I, I'm, 
I'm not going to force myself if I can't, if I don't have something meaningful to say, I'm not going to write another book. Um, but I, I suspect that um, because I'm always keeping an eye on, on information and, uh, you know, looking, trying to find ways of telling a story about information, events, incidents, and so on, um, reading things and listening to pod, interesting podcasts and stuff, um, I, I may hit on an, an angle. And if I do, I, I will certainly try to write another book, but I'm not going to do one just to, oh, because I've already written two, I have to write the third one. Uh, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> a, 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 friend of mine, a friend of mine said, well, now that you've written disinformation, are you going to write dad information and other information? <laughs> <laughs> a, a bad um, dad joke from one of my yes, yeah, dadly friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this was just published, so again, congratulations on that. Um, so you know, you can always just just take in good information, and then yeah, I agree with you. If you're you know if you're inspired to write, by all means, um, you know, keep me posted, and we'll, okay, I, I will. we'll have you on for the third time. Thank <laughs> so. you. I, well, I'll be ha- I, I I hope I. I come up with something worth worth writing about, and you know, I, again, I one of the things I say about this book is I don't have any grand unified theory to explain what's going on in the information world today. You know, I, I don't I don't have the answer, and I, I think you know as I I read these chapters and I talk about things like the role of pop culture and I talk about conspiracy theories and propaganda, you know, all of my ideas I th- I think they should be looked at and and analyzed, and people when they read them should should read them critically and think, well, you know, what, what holds up, what doesn't, you know, how can I, you know, this needs to be picked apart or maybe he's missed a point here. He's, uh, you know, missed something. But I think the ideas for the most part are worth thinking about and worth pulling apart. And, and I think, again, that's, that's really what managing information is all about is, is, is really not just taking things at face value, not just accepting that sort of bright, shiny, simplified, Freedom, yeah, you know, um, version of life. You know, how does buying this big vehicle make me free when I have to make car payments and put gas in it and pay insurance and maintain it? And am I really free by having that or vice versa? Does buying an electric car really make me free? You know, from gas, I'm free from buying gas, but what, you know, where does the energy come from? And you know, all these other questions we have to ask ourselves. So we, we have, you know, to be mindful of things like that and to be, be and you know, to be aware that um, our pop culture and propaganda and conspiracy theories and, and market forces, all these things are manipulating us. And, you know, we just need to be, um, we need to be aware of that and, and be mindful of that. And, you know, if we are going to be manipulated, be mindfully manipulated. Realize, well, you know, I'm buying this idea about freedom here, and I realize they're trying to lead me down a certain path, but you know what? I think that's the right path, and I'm going to go down. That's okay. You know, but but don't just follow it blindly. And that's that's kind of basic advice for living your life. Yeah. <laughs> It's good. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's, uh, that's very good advice. Um, so I, I just want to, you know, as we wrap up, I just want to thank you again. I appreciate you, um, you coming back on uh, to talk about your second book. Um, so thank you for joining us, Donald. Um, and thank you to our listeners for tuning in. Um, I really appreciate it. So until next time, everyone cheers.